All right, sweet. Well, my name's Sean. If I don't know you, I'm glad you're here. This is Pella. Uh, you might have some questions about how we operate, who we are, as we're elder governed, pastoral led, member regulated, and uh, we operate in a mission model, which we say all the time. And so you might have questions about that. Love to help you navigate it. Honestly, I'll, I'll be up here afterwards in the front or by one of the doors. The building's, you know, not gigantic, so we should be able to find each other if we want to get coffee or lunch or something like that. I don't drink coffee because I'm a Christian, but, you know, something like that. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, so, so real quick, uh, two things on the screen for you to be aware of. Number one is we have our night of prayer, which is tonight. We committed to uh, praying more as a church, and uh, we've been doing Wednesday morning prayer and Sunday morning prayer, and then we also have uh, prayer tonight. Uh, we'll be doing some corporate prayer and also individual prayer time. And then also, uh, Easter is about six weeks away, which is crazy. And I bring that up because I'll announce next week where we're doing it. And it's not going to actually be here uh, and what the times are and all that stuff. But we're going to be doing baptisms on Easter. Uh, and if you want to be baptized and you've never been baptized and you call yourself a believer, this is not me telling you, this is the Lord telling you, you need to be baptized, okay? So you might have questions about why uh, we do that, what tradition is behind it, what scriptural precedent is there, what's going on. We'd love to help you navigate all of that. So we're gonna have a baptism class next week. It's actually gonna be at Black Sheep Coffee. Uh, so it's at during the uh, 845 service. So, right, am I right on that? 845 service, is that what it says? Yes, oh, the 10? Okay, the 10 a.m. service. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, about that, you can, you can do that. Now, I will say the QR code in front of you helps you uh, log in or whatever, sign up for any of those classes, or if you have any questions, you wanna get in a community or serve, the QR code in front of you helps you do all of that, or you can see the Connect Desk, okay? Uh, that being said, uh, let's jump in. We've got 10 verses, or 11 verses actually, to cover. Uh, and it, it doesn't feel like a lot, but there's a, a lot of movement going on here that we need to get at. So let me pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll tackle the text. Father, thank you so much for who you are. We are uh, we're grateful that we have uh, your word. We know that we have some brothers and sisters around the world who wish they had just a part of the Bible, and we've got 10 of them. Uh, and so we pray we'd be um, grateful and uh, you'd keep that gratitude in our hearts continually. I pray, God, that you would now let us be obedient and diligent to look at it rightly. Holy Spirit, guide us into truth. Um, grow us in our faith according to Romans 10, 17 through it. Use it as a discerner of our innermost thoughts according to Hebrews 4, 12. Please illuminate it. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to jump in uh, to verse 36. Now, before I do, I need to give a preface of how we're going to tackle our text today, Okay. So in my opinion, some of the best stories that are written are stories that are telling another story, right? Nobody reads Animal Farm and thinks it's about pigs and cows and chickens, right? When you read Animal Farm, you know that he's writing about totalitarianism. You know that he's writing about governmental movements. Same as 1984. It's not about Winston who works at the Ministry of Truth. It's about kind of government overtaking and stuff like that. Now, Disney, in my opinion, has made a buku cash, uh, and I think in all the wrong reasons because of this. You can't watch one Disney movie without there being some kind of uh, agenda behind it. But the reality is there's stories, and stories are leveraged to tell separate things. Um, I think our text is, um, is missed if we just look at the story. In no way do I think it's fiction. It is a very real account, which we're going to get to in a second. But I think it's telling us a ton of different things as well. And so here's what I want to do. I want to look at the 11 verses like we normally do. I want to break them down, do all the things that we normally do. And then I want to stop and go, okay, let's actually look at some things we might be missing that's taking place in the garden right now. There's three things in particular that I think we're missing that, that's going on. And then what we normally do is we get, okay, what do we do with the text? Some application. How do we walk out of here and navigate it? So that's kind of the movement. We'll look at the text and go from there. If you haven't been with us before, it's going to be a big Bible study together. Here it is, verse 36. Then, uh, stop right there. We've gotten far enough. Then is on the heels because we just talked about the Eucharist. Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper. Um, if you read the Gospel of John, he prays what is called the high priestly prayer. In John 17, he prays that we would be one as him and the Father are one. And then we get uh, him taking his disciples to the garden. Here it is. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. Okay, Gethsemane, not Gethsemane. Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking uh, with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me. Now there, there are some movements, I just want you to kind of picture if you can, imagine in your mind. So first we're gonna see, if you look at verse 36, he takes his disciples with him to the garden, okay? And then what he's going to do is he's going to have eight of them stay at one place in the garden, and he's going to take three more. Look at verse 37. He's going to take Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's a James and John, and he's going to take those three, and they're going to go at even further into the garden. And then I know we didn't read it, but look at verse 39. And then going a little further, that's where he falls on his face. So, so you can see the movement is let's all go to the garden. 
Okay, you eight stay here because Judas is out of the picture. You three come with me, and then I'm going to go a little bit further. Those are the movements of what we're reading right now uh, in the garden. Now, uh, just so we can kind of get a good picture of this, I know I'm not a big, like, let's show you some pictures on the screen guy, but I actually think there are some things worth looking at here. Um, you can Google images a thousand times over for the Garden of Gethsemane, and you'll find whatever you want. But I thought it'd be cool to rely on our friends, uh, uh, Tim and Kim, who just went to Israel. They took some pictures. Let me show you these images real quick. Um, so the Garden of, of Gethsemane, Gethsemane means oil press. Um, it's where they make olive oil. It's a huge olive grove. It's on the, the uh, uh, foot of uh, the Mount of Olivet. It's, it's where all these olive trees are. And what you're looking at here, these pictures, um, there are, that we are aware of, eight trees that are in existence today, if you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, that were there at the time of Jesus. Olive trees live forever. There's, there's a, a, a tree in Bethlehem called the Big One, dope name. Um, it's 5,000 years old that, that's there. So these olive trees, we are aware that eight, there's more than eight olive trees there, but there, we know for sure that there are eight olive trees that saw Jesus, that saw his disciples. And if they were tree ants, they'd be able to talk to us, but they're not. Um, now, I, go back to that other picture if, if you could, okay? So this picture is interesting, and, and I want you to see this because the reason I'm bringing up, I know we don't spend time on geography a lot, but this actually is worth bringing up because where Jesus is does not just have historical Old Testament precedent, but has a future hope tied to it, okay? This, what you're looking at right now is off in the distance is Jerusalem. You can see the Dome of the Rock there. At the base is the Garden Wall. That's where you're going to see. Between those two spaces is what's called the Kidron Valley. Now, the Kidron Valley has a ton of Old Testament history, just by way of example. The Kidron Valley is the place where King Solomon built an, an offensive altar to the Lord. It was, it was a, um, a high place that he called it in 1 Kings chapter 7 that the Lord was offended that he built. That was in the also in the Kidron Valley. It's where David fleed from Absalom, uh, from his son who's trying to overtake the kingdom. He fled through that little residence. Look at this. Um, it's told that the, the Valley of Dry Bones, if, if you guys are aware of like raise up those Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 38, that's in the Valley of Kidron. So you're looking at the place where dry bones came to life, right? That's the, the space there. Not only that, and this is also important, in Zechariah, this is what Zechariah says, he prophesies in chapter 14, that a day of the Lord will come where a, the king will stand and rule over the earth on the Mount of Olives. So he'll be looking from this space out towards Jerusalem. That, that's what's going on. Okay, so if you can have some context here, that's the space. And so if you can go back through the slides, Jesus enters into the garden here. And as he's going through the garden, he brings all the disciples. He's maybe eight of them. They stay there. And the eight of them stay there. They're, they're going through it all. There's a picture on here too where like a woman sitting on the bench. That's probably where the disciples were. I don't know. But you can, you can begin to imagine uh, what all that looks like. All right. That being said, listen to the statement that he says at the end of verse 37 and then into 38. As he moves away... He says, and I quote, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me. So he, then he leaves them and then he makes a statement. Then he said, my, or, or before this, not then, but before he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And it feels like it's repeating itself. Well, there's a reason for this. Um, the New Testament authors are struggling with how to communicate what's going on with Jesus right now. Now, we know through the reading of all four gospels that Jesus at this point is sweating blood um, and by my reading, this is the most intense you can get in Koine Greek. It's using the most intense language we could possibly have. And so there's a sense when he's feeling sorrowful and distressed, he's feeling something so intense, but it's more than that. And the gospel writers are trying to communicate it. Listen to how they communicate this. The different, I don't have these on the screen, but different ways. So he became exceedingly sorrowful. That's Matthew. We can see this in Mark. He began to be sore amazed or surprised with terror. That's how Mark is trying to communicate what's going on with him. Luke says he began to be very heavy. And John says uh, he was sorrowful unto death. So the best way that I can explain what's going on in the Greek here is there's two kind of uh, uh, brackets to this. On one side, I want you to think of the person you love most and them dying. There's just this immense weight. He's like, like it's not just the breath pulled out from you, but it's like, this is awful. But, but at the same time, there's also this sense that, Calvin, there's a snake. Calvin, there's a snake. Yeah, you didn't even jump. But if you are feeling, some of you are feeling right now, oh my gosh, Christian, there's a snake next to you. Yeah, no, you were that strong. Other people jump, but you guys are way cooler than them, okay? Um, 
That feeling, if somebody says there's a snake or the feeling that, that shoots lightning, shoots through your, your uh, fingertips, that feeling that you feel in that moment of adrenaline is also what he's feeling. In very real time, what you're feeling is this sense of like, what he's feeling is this sense of like terror, surprise terror, the decisions he's made. He knew he's going to be betrayed. He knew he's following the father's will. But in that moment, he knows exactly what he's going through. And what he's going through is this weight, this um, intense terror. I don't know how to, any other way to get it. And the gospel writers are trying to communicate that, right? Okay. That being said, verse 39, I want to read this because it answers the question, why is he feeling sorrowful? Right, right. We should ask, why is he feeling this immense weight? Verse 39 answers it. And going a little bit further, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, it is, uh, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, I don't think anyone in the room is actually imagining there's like a cup of like fear factor, like there's vinegar or something like that. There's, I, I think we all know this is analogous. What's in front of him is what we're going to read for the rest of Matthew before the resurrection. There's the flogging and there's the, the crown of thorns and there's the crucifixion and there's the unjust uh, ruling by the priests and then uh, he's got to stand before Pontius Pilate. All of it is in front of him. The, trick, the tr uh, tricky part of that though is it's not just the physical things that are, that are on his mind. Because like, if that's just the case of what he physically is about to go through, which is insane, um, I, don't, I don't know if that would be bring about what he's, he's experiencing and starting to communicate. And so I did my best to try to get underneath that and meditate on all the things he's physically going to experience, what, what is also going through his mind in this moment. There are three things that came to mind. I don't know if this is totally right, but I think it was helpful for me. Number one, we have to acknowledge, according to Ephesians 6, there are fiery darts. There are, quote, schemes, mechanisms that the devil is always working against us as believers. And according to Luke 4 and Matthew 4, it is clear, this is true in the temptation of Jesus, um, this is also true in the garden in this moment, that what Satan is trying to do, and if you've ever experienced like what you feel, maybe this is too charismatic, spiritual warfare, you feel this sense of like, it just feels like, like there's demonic forces working against what God is trying to do here. This is also what he's feeling. That's one thing. Number two, and I think might be helpful, is the weight of sin is on him right now. Okay, I mean, he, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he uh, bears sin. He, he knows sin now who never knew sin. Like he, he now is experiencing this and, and he shouldn't have to. And so I want you to imagine for a second what it feels like when you know you shouldn't do that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You know you did it and, and it's done. And now you feel this guilt feel this conviction, you feel this shame, you feel this, why did I do this, Lord? I, I, gosh, you feel this self-hate. I don't know what it is. And all this, now I want you to imagine the weight of the world. He did nothing wrong and he's feeling all of this at once. And then lastly, the future looking of, as we go towards the cross, we're gonna get to a statement eventually where his father averts his face from him. That we're gonna get to a moment where the father turns his face from him and he, um, I don't, the best way I can explain it is, what does hell feel like, honestly? I mean, think of what hell feels like. This is what he's experiencing. So he's very sorrowful. This is the cup of wrath that's in front of him. That being said, he goes and talks to his disciples. Verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if it is uh, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Verse 43, and again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time saying the same words again. So what you have in this moment is three times Jesus is praying this. He goes back to his disciples. He directs his, the statement here to Peter, your, your flesh is uh, weak and your spirit is willing, but obviously he's talking to all three and, and they're just tired. They're sleeping each time. As a matter of fact, if you're somebody who writes in your Bible, you can write right next there, Luke 22, 45. Because Luke 22, 45 tells us that they were, the, the reason that they're tired, Luke says, is they were exhausted from sorrow. So the feeling is, if you can imagine, think of when you cried because of sheer loss until you had no more tears. Like tear ducts are just, they're totally depleted. And you're just exhausted. And then the endorphins hit you of sheer exhaustion and you just pass out. Like you can't keep your eyes open. That, that is what they're feeling. They've been told that their master is gonna be betrayed. They've been told that their master is gonna uh, die and they don't quite understand that he's gonna be raised to life. And so they're going through all of this. They're exhausted. Their adrenal glands have had enough. They're just done. They're tired. And so he comes back. Now, I don't think, this is just uh, my guess. I think we have reasons to believe it because of Luke. 
I don't think when Jesus comes back to his disciples, it's a hard rebuke. Sometimes it's been communicated like, oh, you're an idiot. You fell asleep. Like, yeah, well, apparently the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. I don't think that's the case. This seems to be a soft rebuke in, in understanding what they're feeling. That, 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 that's, and now again, I don't, I hate to try to put a tone on a text, but that seems to be the, the tone more than just a harsh rebuke. That being said, we get 45 and 46. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, so he went away and now he comes back again. And finally, he makes the declaration, not this time, you know, to not watch and pray, which is spiritual alertness and intercession. No, no, no. Now sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, I think verses 45 and 46 consummate the whole section, and it's part of the reason that we're stopping. We're stopping here, not going on with the rest of the passion narrative, because I think what is communicated in verses 45 and 46 is a declaration that a decision has been made. Meaning, if uh, one of my sons uh, went into kidney failure, and he's going to lose both kidneys, and he needs a kidney, it's an easy decision for me to give one of my kidneys to him if if, if it's a match, right? Now, if I can do that, I'm going to do that. But I also understand by doing that, that is going to affect, and I still have one good kidney, but it's still going to affect in small ways the way I live the rest of my life. A decision that I've made affects the way that I'm going to live. I read verses 45 and 46 as if Jesus is saying, okay, it's done. Lord, I'm going. Let's go. That's the way I'm reading it. I'm reading 45 and 46 as the decision has been made. Here's the the betrayer. Judas is, we're going to see uh, next time we're together. We're going to see this, which by the way, we only have six weeks, six more sermons on the gospel of Matthew. And then we're done with Matthew, which is wild. Next week, we're going to talk about liturgy, but then we're going to finish those six weeks, which is just, just crazy. Okay. So that statement, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now we leave here and we're going to find out what the, what uh, everything else happens. Okay. And that's our text. So I said that first part, there's our text. Now I want to ask this bigger question. When we read something like that, not just practical application, but I want to point out what else is going on? Because I think for the most part, this is where we miss it. Even if you grew up in Awanas or VBS, you're aware of what I just read. If you're familiar at all with, even if you didn't grow up in church, you're aware of some kind of weird garden and Jesus in the garden sweating blood, familiar with some of that. What we miss is the theological truths that back all this and are really, really cool, okay? Now, a few people came up to me last week and said, I love that we use terms like transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Those are cool big words. Well, you want big words? I'll give you big words, okay? I got three things that I think are important here. Number one, I think, here's a term, the hypostatic union is on full display right now, okay? Hypostatic union is a thousand dollar word that just simply means that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. He exists as fully God and fully man in in, in this moment. And I think it's on display, not just because of things, for example, like in... um, uh, Oh, geez. Uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4, like, like he's being tempted in a very real sense. But, but I think his, his temptation is legit, okay? Now, here's how I know this. Not but nine chapters ago, we read of Jesus taking his disciples to another point, another mountain, not Mount of Olivet, but the Mount, uh, Mount Tabor. He leaves at that time 10, because Judas is still running with the crew, he ta- or nine, because uh, 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 Judas is still there. Then he brings the three, Peter, James, and John, all three, He brings them up on the mountain. But what happened nine chapters earlier is not what he's feeling right now, but he is transfigured before them. So the same scenario, they're on a different mountain and he's transfigured before them. So Matthew is painted, and we've talked about this again and again and again, that he's God. He's an evangelist evangelizing to Jews and he wants to put in front of the Jews, Jesus is a big deal. But he's not doing that at the detriment of the fact that Jesus is also fully human. So by way of example of this, um, if you look at that statement in our passage, if it is possible, this is Jesus making the statement, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I sometimes hear people talk about how uh, Jesus, like, well, of course Jesus conquered temptation. He's God. Okay, well, yeah, no, duh, right? I get that. But, but that's not what's going on here. In Greek, this is called what, what's called a first-class conditional, meaning in a first-class conditional, it's a very real possibility that the cup could pass from him. That's, a very, that's an option on the table. This isn't, oh, well, he's God, of course he's... No, it's a very real possibility that Jesus and the whole weight of the universe is, is, is in this moment that he could say, I'm not taking this route. Matter of fact, D.A. Carson says it well. He says, all things are possible with God. If it is morally consistent with the Father's redeeming purpose that this cup be taken from Jesus, that is what he deeply desires. But more deeply still, Jesus desires to do his Father's will. Hear that? 
So Jesus does desire to not go down this path that we just talked about, to everything that we're going to read in Matthew, but deeper than that desires to do his Father's will. Jesus' deep commitment to his Father's will cannot be doubted. But in this crisis, the worst sense, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, which is the temptation, Jesus is tempted to seek an alternative to sin-bearing suffering as the route by which to fulfill his Father's redemptive purposes. He prays in agony. And though he is supernaturally strengthened, according to Luke 22, he learns that the cross is unavoidable if he is to obey the Father's will. What I want you to hear is it's real. So do me a favor if you can. Let's let's actually study the Bible, right? Uh, If you can, open your Bible real quick to Hebrews chapter 5. John over there to Hebrews chapter 5. The context of Hebrews uh, in general is this idea that Jesus is better. Calvin actually says... The reason we know that uh, Hebrews is canon because it glorifies Jesus and makes him better than all things. That Jesus is better than angels. He is better than the tabernacle. He's better than the promised land. He's better than Moses. He is better. He's better. He's better. Well, at the end of chapter 4, into Hebrews chapter 5, it says he's better than a priest. Now, I want to start by reading chapter 5, and then I want to go back to read the end of chapter 4. So here's chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Now just stop. What it's saying is in the Old Testament, when a priest would offer a sacrifice, if we've ever wondered what that looks like, he's able to go offer a sacrifice for all the people because he knows what it's like to be part of the people. He knows what it's like to be beset with weakness. No, I'm, I, this is also for Joe. Joe, I know he committed sin. I know what it's like to look at things I know I should. I know it. He's experiencing that. This is actually why he has to offer a sacrifice for himself before he can offer a sacrifice for the people. He's beset with weakness. Now, the writer of Hebrews is picking up on this idea and points it to Jesus. Look at verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And then goes on to explain the kills the deck, which I definitely get into right now in verse 10. The point is this. I want you to look at that statement in verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. This is speaking to Jesus' humanity. We're almost there. Now we look at that word for in verse one and ask, okay, why is that there? Go to the end of chapter four and then I hopefully, hopefully all this makes sense of why I'm bringing up the hypostatic union right now. In verse 14 of Hebrews chapter four, right before we read, uh, but right before what, it's right before what we read, it says this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So listen to me. God has provided propitiation, is the fancy word, for your sin. He has provided an atoning work for your sin. God has done that. But he did it as a man. You understand? He did it as a man. He's fully God and fully man. It's the hypostatic union. But he is not just telling you now, go suffer. He's not just telling you, experience the hardships in my name. But he's not pointing you down. He's not just pointing down the road. But he is saying, follow me down this. Yeah, I know what it's like to be tempted. I know exactly what it's like. I know what it's like to feel weak. I know what it's like to feel tired and betrayed and hurt. I know what it's like to cry. And so Matthew paints not just the transfiguration, but now he puts a human element on Jesus. He's actually tempted. And now he puts in space for us to go, Jesus, because you actually experienced this, you know what it's like to be tempted. And yet you were successful in this where I am not. I rely on your righteousness. It's awesome. It's awesome. Okay. The second thing, so that's the hypostatic union. The second thing that I think might be missed in the garden is what is called um, a federal headship, okay? The doctrine of federal headship. We're getting it right now, okay? I think the doctrine of federal headship is absolutely on display here. Now, here's how we understand the doctrine of uh, federal headship. Um, right now, I'm currently doing nine premarital uh, uh, counseling sessions with, uh, with uh, couples that are getting married. There's one thing I've learned over the last three and a half years at Pella. If you want to find your spouse, he or she is somewhere in this room, okay? Uh, by he or she, it means opposite gender is what I mean by that, Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so they are somewhere in this room right now, right? Now, now uh, there's so many people getting married. It's just the season of our church. And every time we're doing these, these sessions, they're trying to think through their life. 
And as they think through their life, they're going to make a decision, okay? So let's say, you know, we have Jacob and Michaela. They make a decision that they are going to go move to Tennessee. Now, here's what's crazy. In making that decision to go move to Tennessee, they then decide they're going to have kids. Now, let me ask you a question. Did their kids decide to be born in Tennessee? No. They had zero say in that. Zero say in that decision. And so they're going to be raised if they stay there in Tennessee, and they had zero say in that. And that's going to affect the way they grow up. You want to know why? Because there is something called headship. Now, headship is not just from parents to that, but now I want you to think of your parents, 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 parents. Let's go back five generations. That grandma or grandpa made a decision for you. I mean, maybe you want to go back to where they live, or you want to stay here because there's a, all those movements, all those decisions made a decision for where you live and how you operate right now. Federal headship is an acknowledgement in our Christian worldview that all of those decisions go all the way back to Adam and Eve. That Adam made a decision as a representative for us. And so we experience the weight of his decision. And his choice was disobedience. That was his decision. And because of that, uh, by way of example, um, Sam and, and Dylan were over at my house on Friday and we're working on the farm and we're just grinding. We're literally, quite literally, tilling the land, okay? We're putting a garden in place and we're tilling the land. And I kept saying two things over and over, which Dylan was getting frustrated. One is, it's crazy that, uh, honestly, people have been doing this for thousands of years. We're literally doing what people have been doing for thousands of years. But two, I just kept saying, this is Adam's fault, okay? <laughs> because here's the reality. You're breathing in mulch. It's, it's not even that hot yet, but you're sweating. My wrist hurts, my back hurts, and I'm just tired. I don't want to do this. And it doesn't have to be this way, but my federal head, Adam, made a decision to sin and in so doing affected me all the way down here that when I do this, it produces thorns and thistles. Women, this is the reason, because of Eve's decision, this is the reason, Adam and Eve's decision together, you have pain in childbirth. The federal head made a decision and we are under them. Well, Paul picks up on this idea. Paul understands that this is going on. And so what he does is he comes along and he writes the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter five, he identifies what is called federal headship. He identifies this and he says, Jesus is offering himself to be a new federal head. He's actually putting in front of you, you don't have to be under Adam anymore. You can now be under Jesus. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter five. He says in verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin enters the world through Adam, and now we all die because we all sin, right? That's Adam's lineage. Now, it talks about the law for a little bit. Skip to verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more will have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace uh, of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification, which is talking about Adam and Jesus, all the things that took place to him. Verse 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, that's Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the uh, one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And so now you're asking, well, what does federal headship have to do with the garden? If 45 and 46, or uh, yeah, 45 and 46, are, or 46 and 47, are this declaration of moving forward, the decision has been made. Okay, check this out. There's only one other time in scripture, one other time that somebody was tempted in a garden. Only one other time in scripture, in the Garden of Eden. And Adam failed. And so Jesus comes along, and of course, this is what's picked up on by Paul. He gives us more than just that. Adam, in Adam, we lost God's presence. In Jesus, we get his presence back. In Adam, sin entered the world. In Jesus, righteousness is obtained. In Adam, physical and spiritual death affect all. In Jesus, there's a promise that we will die no more. In Adam, he failed to trust God in the garden, and, we, and his debt was uh, debted towards us. In Jesus, perfectly trusts God in the garden, and obedience is in, uh, uh, imputed onto us. It's called the doctrine of double imputation. We're using all kinds of fancy words today. Right? The idea is that Jesus succeeded. And so now the offer stands that Jesus, if you want it to be, you can remain under Adam if you want, but Jesus can be your federal head. And so as I'm tilling up thorns and thistles as a Christian, my hope is one day I'm going to have a freaking 7,000 acre garden and I'm not going to sweat one iota. 
I'm just going to till that thing. I'm going to be like high-fiving people. And it's not going to be not an issue at all. I'm going to work. I'm going to be on that grind. Believe that, okay? But it's not going to be difficult. And it's not going to bring about thorns and thistles. That's not what's going to happen. My hope is in what Jesus has promised. He is the federal head. The last one, and I'm going to ask you to turn to one more place. Acts chapter 1. And this might be the coolest one. If you can, turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 takes place after Jesus leaves the garden, after he's taken away from the garden. He makes the decision. He's taken from the garden unjustly. He's flogged, crown of thorns. He stands before Pontius Pilate. All that goes on, he ends up uh, uh, being crucified. He ends up raising from the dead. He has breakfast with his disciples by the, the sea. All that goes on. After all of that, you get Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are going, dude, you just, their boy just raised from the dead. I mean, so they're standing there victoriously going, is now the time? And this is what happens in, in verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and of Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. So they're going, is now the time? He's going, no. It's not, and we live in what's all called an already not yet. One day everything will be consummated and it'll be a restoration to all things, but that's not the time right now. Right now, I need you to go forward as my witnesses in victory. I mean, I've conquered death in victory to Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the earth. Then the, what is called the ascension takes place in verse nine. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So now they're watching Jesus ascend and then suddenly there's just these angels appearing and they're like, what's going on, right? And so like, why are you staying? I'm like, what do you mean, why am I staring? Jesus is floating into the sky, right? And so there's this kind of weird interaction that's going on. What I want you to read though is verse 12, okay? Verse 12 tells us where all this takes place. Look at verse 12. Then they return to Jerusalem, okay? From where? From the mount called Olivet. From that picture, they go through Kidron Valley and they go to Jerusalem. They go from the garden to Jerusalem. That's the ascension where they're sent out in victory. The last time they were there, Jesus was in sorrow. And so Jesus sends them out from the place of sorrow where he last left. He sends them out in victory. He sends out, because I conquered what was in front of me, you now go forward in victory. That's so poetic. Only Jesus can do it the way that he's doing it here. This is masterful because he goes this time, he is going to Jerusalem to be crucified. They're going now to witness to the fact that he was raised from the dead. That's what's happening. And so it goes full circle that we can see in what, what takes place. And it all starts with this decision, which leads us to the last thing. And then I'll pray for us. The big question then is, well, what do we do? We've got the Garden of Gethsemane in front of us. What do we do with this passage? And first and foremost, we acknowledge just the, um, the sheer grit. I don't know if that's the right word. We'll stick with the word obedience. The obedience of Jesus. I mean, this decision is what sparks everything else. He has something offered in front of him, and he chooses obedience. I'll never forget Leonard Ravenhill quote in his book, Why Revival Tarries. He says, it's in Gethsemane where he dies. The cross is just the proof of that. That he decided in Gethsemane, he decided in the garden, Lord, I'm going to submit to your will and only death is in front of me. And of course, in the resurrection and the ascension is all in place, but he moves forward in obedience. And so it begs the question, do we only benefit from his decision or is there a call to response? And of course, we do benefit from his decision. He is obedient. He is our federal head and we get to work in grace because of that. But now the decision has to be made. And I'm not trying to get sexy with the text, but the reality is, all of us at some point, many in this room, even right now, as we've continued to be upset with our friends who are kind of half in, half out, lukewarm Christians, but where are you at, my man? Where are you at? Because if the decision's made to be in, stop messing around with all this crap. If the decision's made, let's follow the Lord's will. Let's go. And that's where we're going. If that's where we're going. If you don't want to go, then don't go. But if you're in, make the decision and be in. And it starts right here where Jesus is, in the garden. As a matter of fact, Oswald Chambers wrote in his, it's a, this devotional, I read this probably 16 years ago. He said, the honor of Jesus Christ is at stake in our bodily life. Are you remaining loyal to the Son of God and the things which beset his life in you? Do you continue to go with Jesus? The way lies through Gethsemane. 
That's where it lies. Through the city gate, outside the camp, the way lies alone. The way lies until there is no trace of footsteps left. Only the voice, follow me. So that's a, that, that, that's a lonely, this is where Jesus is like, I, I just, I want to follow. And if I'm going to pick up my cross, I need to decide now I'm going to pick up my cross and then every day I'm going to pick up my cross. If I'm going to be all in and I'm going to continue to work on sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow Jesus. And remember, he's not just saying go down that road. He's telling you to follow him because he's gone down it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to um, look at Matthew and honestly just see Jesus, you and the distress that you're going through, the turmoil that you're going through. Uh, I do pray, God, that we would see the weight of our own sin in this moment, that we'd recognize um, what you're going through is because of what we have done and what we continue to do. And I pray that we would have grace continue to train us, according to Titus 2, that we would be a people that sees this and follows you to deny ourselves, deny our flesh, and be about your business, Father. Holy Spirit, we need your help to do that well. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.